Hello. Please take a seat by the fire. Today's story takes us back to Adrossan Castle and the affairs of Sir Fergus Barclay and the story The Enchanted Saddle collected by Anna Blair in her book Tales of Ayrshire published in 1983. Sir Fergus of Adrossan was the last of the line of the Barclay family, a man famous in all the countries of Europe for his unfailing good fortune at the gaming table and racing course, and for the fleetness of his fine horses. The swiftness of these animals was so breathtaking that it came to be thought unearthly and that Sir Fergus's secret lay in an enchanted saddle he had had as a gift from his friendly intercourse with the devil. It was universally believed that he had given his soul to Satan in exchange for good success at the gambling and victory in any contest with his horses. One day, having left his finest animal at the edge of a woodland to go shooting on foot amongst the trees, he came back to find his beautiful silver trim saddle gone and so enraged was he at the theft, and so distressed, that he did not speak to a living soul for a week. The truth was, said suspicious rivals, that Fergus feared Satan's anger at his carelessness, and trembled at what dreadful future lay in store, now that he was out of favour with his master. They waited to see his fortune change, and change it did. Sir Fergus had two children, a son by his loved first wife, a lad most precious and promising, and by his less loved second wife, a bonny young daughter, in some danger of spoiling by her doting mother. The boy would someday be as skilful a horseman as his father, for he had sat there addressing animals well since childhood, but he was young and to Sir Fergus's mind lacked wise judgement about the size and spirit of the mounts he wanted to ride. There was one beautiful, chestnut high, proud and handsome, as if to taunt those who slandered that he'd truck with the devil, Barclay called Lucifer, and it was young Barclay's dearest ambition to gallop Lucifer over the hill behind Adrossan. But the horse was wild-tempered and sensitive, much too spirited for the boy to ride. Some months after the loss of his famous bridle and saddle, Sir Fergus had to make a long journey on a slow but sturdy mare, leaving Lucifer at home, along with his children and his second wife. He left also serious and grave warning that under no circumstances was his son to go near, far less mount the chestnut horse. Lady Barclay tolerated her stepson quite kindly. He was a lively, likeable youth, and she was not a wicked woman but she was the mother of Sir Fergus's only other child, the lass who was his second heir. Whether she encouraged or merely consented to young Barclay taking out the nervous horse, the story does not tell, but his father was scarcely half a day's journey away from Adrossan, when a stable lad was persuaded to saddle the animal and lead it out to the courtyard. The young rider had the most exultant and joyous hour of his life, flying across the moors, thundering down the riverside, his long curl streaming out behind him. And then, a loose stone flew up from Lucifer's hoofs and terrified the horse so that it reared wildly <laughs> and threw the lad onto the river bank where his head struck a stone and he was killed. When Sir Fergus came home and heard of the tragedy, he was distracted and grief-stricken. Scarcely knowing what he did, he slew his wife who had allowed his son to ride Lucifer. Leaving his now motherless daughter, he fled to Arran, and there shut himself into the solitary tower of Kildonan, with no company but a single servant boy. And there he stayed, almost without comforts or possessions, for several long years. He seldom left the tower, but one chill day in winter he went walking in a lonely place to find some extra kindling for their fire. There he met a gypsy woman 
who looked strangely at him and offered to read his palm. He would have thrown her aside, but something in her narrow eyes held him and he gave her his hand. Your hand tells of woe and sorrow, good master, she began. It tells that if you should ever set foot on Irish soil, then your death will be close at hand. Sir Fergus now had little wish to reach old age, but he laughed grimly at the gypsy all the same, for he had no links with Ireland across the water there, no kin, no business, no prospect of ever setting foot on Irish soil. He told her so, but she repeated her warning as if he had not heard. It was a month later that Fergus ventured out once again from the keep, this time to find some fresh seaweeds to make a pot of soup. He was abroad at daybreak, walking along the deserted beach so that he would meet no one. He strode along over some turf sods laid out to dry along the shore, no doubt being prepared for making a house roof. Then he saw a fishing boat at the jetty half a mile away, so he gathered a bundle of tangle in the tide line and made quickly for the tower, before there were men from the boat ashore. Over their broth that night, the servant told him that the boat was Irish. She had brought a lot of special tufts for a being Aaron Cotman over the hill and the crew had set them on the shangle for collecting. Now Fergus of Adrossan knew that his hour had come. He bade the young man take his body when he died, stitch it into a bullock's hide and place it on the shore when the tide was out. In a few days, he was dead of a fever and the loyal servant did as he was bidden, then retired to the flat dunes to watch over his strange master until the waves carried the body away. The tale ends with the uncanny washing ashore of Sir Fergus de Barclay under the walls of his own castle at Adrossan. His daughter, now a grown and gracious young woman, had it taken up then and buried in the family chapel. No one knows if any of his old rivals even cared, after all these years, whether they had been right or wrong about the devil and Fergus Barclay's soul. By then they had turned their attention to another gambling laird, who, like Adrossan before him, had a stable of flying horses and a silver truceried leather saddle, uncommonly like the one stolen from Sir Fergus so many years before.